not end here. Like we know in sacred scripture, whenever there is a beginning, there is a coming to fulfillment. And that fulfillment hasn't happened because all of us are not yet in heaven. And so what we're going to be doing is while this may be the last Thursday that we're going to be sharing together, the stories continue out there. You've been hearing a lot from Father Angelus. You've been hearing from myself. And you will be hearing from our clergy tonight. But afterwards, our story needs to be shared as well. And so our story gets told out there with our lives, with our models, with our examples. And one of the ways that we can do that is I'm going to invite Nick up here, and he's going to be able to talk a little bit about how we can begin to share our story and how is it that we are able to share our story because Christ has enlivened us. You can clap, I guess. Hi, my name is Nick Braun. I am a staff member here, for those of you who do not know me. Um, we are coming up on our uh our second round of putting together the Alpha program. We ran one last um, spring. If you, um, if you attended that, would you please raise your hand so people can see you? So we have a lot of people who attended Alpha. Um, if you did not, you can ask one of those people a question or you can find me after, um, after the talk and I've got some little sign-up cards and stuff for you if you are interested in Alpha. It will take place on Thursdays just like this. Um, and it'll run from um, six th uh, about 6.30 to 8. We will start after Labor Day, so we have to wait until September for us to begin. But what Father was saying is definitely applicable to Alpha. Alpha is a place for you to take your story, your faith story, and start to put it out to other people. Um, I, I tell people this all the time. I think we make the mistake a lot of going to church and then intaking spirituality and then going home and never putting it back out, and just kind of holding on to it right here. Alpha is a place where we don't want to do that. We want to share. We want to um, talk about what, what we know, what we've learned, wh how we live, things like that. Um, and it's, it's, it's fun. So if you have any questions, please come see me. All right, so our first speaker of the night is actually our newest addition here to St. Killian. <laughs> Father Ben is our new addition to St. Killian. He's been here for about three and a half weeks. The 27th, so yeah, almost four weeks. He's been ordained for less than two months at this point. It's exciting. We have Father Ben fresh from the factory, zero miles on him. <laughs> and so Father Ben is actually going to be able to share some of his first priestly experiences that he's had with us. And also he's going to talk about his story about how it is that he understood that the Lord was calling him. And so now without further interruption, Father Ben. Thank you, Father Brandon. Good to see y'all today. Um, like Father Brandon said, I am a newly ordained, uh, or you can call it a, a, a baby priest, <laughs> right? Yeah, F Father Angelo called me baby priest, yeah. <laughs> the experience that I have at St. Killian is more like earlier I shared with some of you guys that for a newly ordained, the first assignment is similar to your first love. Because we don't know what you expect, right? We just live our life full of it. So St. Gillian, give me a sense of belonging here. You guys can make me well adjusted. I'd love to be here. Okay. So Father Angelo and Father Brandon also, you know, still patient with me. So let you just you guys know that, even though he's still listening right now up there somewhere. So that's little bit, little bit about my life adjustment here at Saint Killian. Now going back to my vocation story. I would say vocation story 
I don't remember how many times I share with uh, maybe Father Brandon heard it more than at least more than twice. But then I believe every vocation is a gift from God. It is a gift that for myself, I did not recognize it when I w grew up. Because basically I don't, when I was finished high school and college, I didn't want to be, become a priest. But then later in 2015, first started, I just remember it was on the vigil, vigil of uh, Divine Mercy Sunday. I went to listen to the, to the talk. And later on, it has a mass. And then they have a, they call healing service. Anybody know what is the charismatic movement here? Yeah. I wasn't convinced back then. So my purpose was I just went to the, to listen to the talk, go to mass, and go home. Because like many of us, I was born at a cradle Catholic. Go to church, go to mass, that's it. And even I remember I have to repeat my first commun communion class. So we'll see, that is, how could I become a priest? Uh, why do I come become a priest if, you know, you figured it out? But in 2015, after the talk, after the mass, on the way to the parking lot, then there was a healing service. I saw some priests pray over some people, and I saw people fell. I was like, I was thinking, no, that is must be joking. That's <laughs> in insane. So I was like, okay, stop, step back, observe a little bit. Wasn't convinced either, so I went home. The next few days, I called the priest who was m at my home parish, who was the um, parochial, par parochial vicar. So I explain. I asked him, "Can you explain to me why, when you pray over them, why did why did they fall down? Why? What happened? Even you don't touch them, or maybe, And then I said, "Did you push them?" <laughs> so the priest said, "Well, I know what you're talking about, but I don't push them." And then I said, "Explain to me why." And he said that this was. A basically is a long explanation, but I just remember that is the state of um, resting uh, state in Holy Spirit. So, and then he said, long story short, he said, by the way, we will have a, wait, wait, I called him first, he didn't pick up the phone, I left a message, he called me back, and then he said, okay, come to see me. So I came to see me, uh, I came to see him on my day off, right? And he asked, he invited me to go to a um, healing service. I said, you didn't listen to me, right? <laughs> I don't believe in those things. And he said, well, we have mass, and then if you like, we can listen. To, I mean, I invite you to experience the um, healing service. I thought to myself, no. And then, but I said, well, just be of uh, you know kind and just go to mass and that's it right because I told him that's that too much it's it not me <laughs> so in the end I think he challenged me he said um, instead of standing here and we pray over them why don't you why don't we just set up the chairs and people come in I was like you kidding me you ch want to challenge me why how can I you know well, if I s sat down, right? If I sit down, how can I do that? So I said, okay, I will, I will prove it to you. That is, it doesn't work for me anyway. <laughs> and I came, so I, I, I decided to came up, and there was him and another deacon on the two ends. 
So I purposely set it on the other, the, the other end with the deacon. I was reasoning that if the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter who pray over me, let me get it right. So I went over there, sat over there, and opened, up my, opened myself up. And the deacon, I, I suppose, I mean, I expect the deacon. But then he, <laughs> the priest, I don't know how, he went over there. <laughs> right? So he pray. Now he says something in the very weird language. I know that's not English, not Spanish, no Vietnamese. <laughs> so I assume that oh, probably be Latin, right? <laughs> Thing happened. I was like, I cry. I was like, what is going on with me? So he just prayed and I cry and then didn't feel okay, good, which is good, right? So he blessed me. I went home. Nothing happened. But a few days later, I woke up in the middle of the night. The first thing I wanted to, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to go to confession. So I cannot go back to sleep. I get up. I know my church, they have uh, confession almost like every day. So I went to confession, and then later on, I just feel that I want to do something else, but I don't know what it is. And then I talk to the priest again. Become a priest is still not my desire. I said, probably not. And a couple of weeks later, he said, why don't you try to go to daily mass and I was asking, are you kidding me? I'm working. <laughs> but then I was like, okay, if I don't do that, how can I say that it cannot work for me? I have to try it first. If it doesn't work out, then I have a reason to say no, right? Go back to my work. I went to search the church around at my workplace to have Daily Mass, guess what? 10 minutes away from my workplace. <laughs> there ha they have a Daily Mass at 12.10. <laughs> I was like, okay. Now I remember two weeks, two, is last week? Is that last week? No, last Tuesday. And people asked Jesus, mother of John and uh, James, right? Ask Jesus something, and then Jesus, you don't know what you're asking for. That is like, I feel like that. I don't know what I'm asking for, basically. So, and then I have no reason for not going to daily mass. So the moment I'm, you know, the day that after day I go to daily mass, I feel like dr draw m God draw me into to him but still doesn't know what I'm gonna do, right? So late on at the end of September, there was a pilgrimage to Medjugorje. <laughs> but I still, oh okay, I'm, I'm not really wanna become a priest. I just want to get away from my work. <laughs> I took a vacation, <laughs> right? So I signed up on last minute, that's on Saturday night, and I called up the lady, the contact person. I said, do you still open? Do you still get, you know, get the people want to enroll? I want to go. And, um, but I need to talk to my supervisor to get the vacation, uh, approve of my vacation. But I want, I want you, you to know that I'm will going. She said, okay, uh, right now it's kind of you know, late, but then I still, make an exception and you can call me back on Monday. So I wa went to work and submit my uh, vacation. And well, you know that you work for government that you don't have to ask for your vacation because that is your vacation, you, that is your time. You just notify them. This is my attitude to talk to my supervisor. This is Anita time off. 
So I went and um, I didn't know the priest at the pray over me. He was on that trip too. <laughs> so during the pyramid, I was like, okay, what is going on with me? Then why am I here? Why am I in, end up here? But before I'm going to the trip, nobody at my family know that I, I, have, I was thinking to go like pursuing the priesthood. It wasn't very clear yet. Only my brother. Before that, he and I just bought a house. So I just told him, okay, I think I might become a priest. So <laughs> keep the secret from me. Don't tell anybody in the family. But then I just want you to know if I'm going to, after I'm going to this pyramid, and then I decide to become a priest. And then if you comfortable to make, continue to make a mortgage, then we keep it all the while we have to put us the house on sale. And he said, give me your two weeks. I said, okay, just think over and then talk to me when I come back. So the trip was like, I received a lot of grace. Pray over me again and crying, whatever, <laughs> right? So in the end, it was affirmation for me that I decide to pursue my priesthood. But then I did not go to the vocation of it with the Diocese of, of Orange because I did not know. I didn't even go to the first meeting, discernment meeting at all. I discerned with a Jesuit priest who was a chaplain at UCI. He was a well-known among co Vietnamese community. So I told him about my experience during the pyramid in Metrogory. He was able to help me to see what is really going on for my vocation. He said, this is like a mirror. I just repeat your story and we'll point to you what is God has called you to to this day to, to this to this stuff I was like wow and I did not know what is this, this uh, difference between religious order and diocesan either I have no idea I just said okay priest is the same with religious or diocesan Discerned with the Jesuit almost two years, a year and a half. They, s they keep asking me, are you ready? I said, I'm kind of ready, but then, then they ask, why are you waiting to fill out the application? And I said, give me some time. And then he's the vocation director for the Jesuit. He's, he said, okay, why don't you go to the, the five-day uh, five silent retreat? I said, mm, are you sure? Because I am more like, some people know me that I'm, um, what do you call it, extrovert. <laughs> I cannot be silent. <laughs> I need to talk to people, right? But I went. So I love it. I love the structure. I love the setting with the uh, religious order. But then on the halfway through the, thir the third day, after I had my holy hour, I was thinking, back then I know a little bit about the difference between the religious order and diocesan, right? So I was like, I felt so pity for the diocese, diocesan priest because they don't have the community support. They don't have the directly communi uh, community support. And I was thinking, if I just picked the good uh, stuff and then l left the unwanted for other. It's kind of unfair, so right? So I feel pity for them. And then I said, why don't I try diocese and um, apply for the, the, uh, with the diocese? And I told, when I came back, I told the Jesuit, the um, spiritual director, he was disappointed. <laughs> he said, 
I've been working with you almost two years. And why don't you just like realize that you're not fitting? I said, not just that. I just want to try something. It's like I'm drawing to it. I just try to find out. And later on, he said, okay, just go ahead, try it, and then come back anytime. If uh, Come back if it doesn't work for you. And then I knock the, the door of the vocation office. The first thing I said, Father, I'm ready. May I have the application, please? He was like, who are you? <laughs> Sit down, have a seat, and we talk. And we talk about half an hour or 45 minutes or an hour. He said, leave me your email, and then we will contact you. So later on, he contacted me and sent me the uh, application. That is about 2017. 2017, and filled the application, got accepted with the diocese, and went through uh, the process of the uh, uh, application with the testing and psychology test, whatever. And I got accepted, and they sent me to St. John Seminary, and that was seven years ago, and here I am. So the to sum up my story, it's a gift. And I was, I mean, my vocation is the late vocation because when I discerned or recognized that is I want to do something with my life, what God want me to do, I was born in 1978. So 2015, what, 35, 36 years old? I said, well, I thought it's like it wasn't my vocation. It's old. So if God want me to become a priest, that is, he have to make things happen. And I, like other seminarian, just accept the invitation and let, leave the rest to God. And I know that every single vocation is unique and different and un like every single one is unique and unrepeatable as St. John Paul II said. So every single vocation, I believe that is it's unique. Father Brendan have different vocation. Our seminarian Thomas have different vocation story. It's so, it's very personal to God. It's only God and I, we know our story. And I thank God for his gift that I got, um, I received it and I respond to his uh, calling, invitation. That's all my kid's story. <laughs> so I give the microphone back to Father Brandon. All right, thank you Father Ben for sharing your story with us. <laughs> and so tonight what we're going to be doing is as we're sharing from all the clergy we're going to be talking about our future we pray god willing our current seminarian thomas is discerning a vocation of the priesthood and during that time in seminary it really is discovering if this is what the lord is calling me to if this is what that gift of the holy spirit is enlivening my heart to fully understand to offer my life as a living sacrifice to the lord and so we happen to have a seminarian, Thomas, who we're going to hear a little bit about his story, what has led him to this path, and how we as a people can continue to support him in his discernment. We can support him definitely by prayer. That shouldn't be a secret, right? <laughs> so for us that are here, we know that we have a seminarian, but do we remember to pray for him every day? And if the answer is no, then we can start tonight, okay? So let's welcome Thomas. Hi, everybody. So just to let you know, I've never talked to this many people at once. So I'm really nervous, and you guys all look really mean from up here. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You don't. Uh, <laughs> so um, I've told this before at the seminary, but um, I'll kind of give you some background about me, because that is my vocation story. Um, 
I was born to a young mother. She was 17 or 18, and my dad was 21. They were not married. And my mother, her parents were from Poland. And she was actually going to have an abortion with me. And my dad's parents talked to her and you know, said, we'll help you support him. You should keep him. So she did. Um, my mom was not a practicing Catholic. She wasn't even baptized until I was in the second grade. She got baptized with me. Um, and my dad was not practicing Catholic either. Growing up, we didn't really go to mass ever. Uh, I went to Catholic school from kindergarten to the 12th grade though. Because of my dad's parents, they paid for it. But one thing, my mother, when I was probably three or four years old, did teach me how to pray before I went to bed every night. And she taught me how to do the sign of the cross. So that to me was realizing later on my first little glimpse at Christ. So as I got a little bit older, five and six, my parents fought a lot. My dad was an alcoholic. Um, they had a really kind of tumultuous relationship. And I would come home from school. I had some really wonderful grandparents and even great grandparents because I was born when my parents were so young. I knew almost all of them. So they would pick me up from school and help me with homework and all of this. But I also had some really good neighbors. There was this old lady who lived across the street from us. She was born in 1912. I know this because my name's Thomas Andrews, and that's the same name as the guy who built the Titanic, and she was born the year the Titanic sunk. <laughs> so she never had got married and never had kids, but she was a really devout Catholic, and I used to go to her house after school. She had been a teacher for 60 years, and she would ask me what I had learned at school and help me with homework, and she gave me my first rosary. And so my parents would fight and things like that, and I would lay in bed and hold this rosary. And I didn't know how to pray it, really, but I knew it was, it was something powerful and something important. Uh, when I was in the third grade, uh, don't worry, this is not all sad, okay? Uh, <laughs> but when I was in the third grade, my mom almost died. She was in the hospital for four months. And I was really nervous about that, and, and I was left at home with my dad, and he wasn't the greatest about getting ready in the morning and stuff, but I had also started altar serving at school during that same year. So there was a really great old priest uh, named Father Al Dresch, and he was a uh, Franciscan, and he would be like 150 by now probably, but <laughs> he was a really humble, simple, quiet guy. And he never said anything really, but he knew the situation with my parents, and after Mass, he would always say, come in here and take me into the office and heat up one of those Jimmy Dean breakfast sandwiches <laughs> and give it to me for my breakfast. And he really encouraged me, explained a lot of things about the Mass to me, and that's when I really fell in love with the Mass and with the Eucharist. So I really leaned on him. He was wonderful. Um, in the fourth grade, I think, my parents actually got a divorce, um, and my dad ended up getting married like four more times, but um, <laughs> I ended up moving in with my grandparents, my dad's parents, and they were really normal. I mean, like, just, you wouldn't notice them from anyone else, just normal, solid people, but I, you know, I always kind of yearned for something more, um, and they kind of went to Mass. I mean, they were Catholic, but not super Catholic. Um, so I started going to Mass by myself on Sundays, and then I started going with my best friend's family. Um, high school was kind of normal. It was really fun. I did a lot of stupid things. Um, and then I went to college, and I joined a fraternity. Again, lots of fun, probably way too much fun, actually. <laughs> um, but I started going to Mass again. I, I, th I think I had went the whole time, but I, I was always still going to Mass in college. And... My freshman year, I was like, hmm, I think I should be a priest. <laughs> and it wasn't the first time. When I was a kid, I used to go and play mass outside with my neighborhood kids. I would always be the priest, and they had to, like, <laughs> be the altar servers. Um, so it wasn't the first time I had thought about that, but it was the first time I seriously thought about it. And I, 
I called my grandmother. I remember I was standing in the hallway of my dorm, and I was like, hey, I am nervous. I have something to tell you. And knowing my dad's history, she was like, oh, no, somebody's not pregnant, please. <laughs> and I was like, no, I think I, I think I want to be a priest. And she was like, oh, this is almost just as bad. <laughs> uh, and so she said, you know, I really want you to think about it. Please don't rush into that, because she had an idea of, um, you know, she would have some life experience and, and know more about life. Uh, so I did. I, I kind of put it in the back of my mind. Um, and then I ended up moving to Washington, D.C. And I really like art and antiques, if anybody knows me here. So I ended up becoming an antique appraiser in Washington, D.C., and I was a realtor. And I loved it. I like to go out to eat, which I still do. <laughs> Anybody who wants to take me, <laughs> I'm always available. <laughs> um, but I really had a great great time and I loved it and I was still going to mass and then I slowly stopped and I didn't go to mass for like two years and one day I had parked in the parking garage and I was walking to my office and I passed this Catholic church and I felt this feeling I should go in and pray and I, I still prayed before I went to bed things like that but never really in the church and I didn't go to mass anymore that much and um I went in and I, I started praying and I just started weeping, like crying. And now I'm kind of a baby, but I don't usually just cry like for no reason. And, and I felt like God was telling me right then, you know what you're supposed to do. And I started going to daily mass. Um, I went to confession probably for the first time in like five or six years. And I kept feeling in the back of my mind like, you're supposed to be a priest. I want you to be a priest. So I hated that idea, and I was so upset. And I would drive home from work, and I'd call my best friend that I grew up with, who's like my brother, and I would cry and be like, I don't want to be a priest. That sounds miserable. <laughs> and I kept making little timelines. I'd be like, well, I'm going to wait six more months, or I'll wait one year. And after about six months of doing this and calling my best friend almost every day, like so upset and nervous. He was like, dude, you know what you're supposed to do. Just talk to somebody. Go do it. I'm tired of you calling me. <laughs> so I waited a little bit, but then I, I talked to my grandparents' pastor. He was this, he, well, he's still alive. He's this great Vietnamese priest and, and just kind of wacky, but really, really holy. And <laughs> I see Christ in him so much, and, and he really gave me a good foundation um, and advised me on, you know, steps and the processes and things that I should be thinking about and praying about. Um, and so I had decided that I would talk to somebody about going to the seminary. And about a month after that happened, my dad died of a heart attack at the age of 50, um, just really suddenly. And I was sort of, I talked to him, but we were not very close. But at his funeral, his wife at the time had told me, you know, and my dad, I didn't think he was very religious at all. I had never seen him really go to mass or anything, but she told me, you know, you won't know this, but your dad would pray for an hour every single night in his room, like for you. And I often think now, like, you know, maybe he was praying and maybe that's why I was able to kind of hear God's call to me then. Um, so my dad died and I ended up coming to California and I actually lived at St. Barbara, which is an all Vietnamese parish. Um, and so I lived there for like six months and I, I worked in the parish a little bit, got involved. I taught... Vietnamese catechism, actually, to sixth and seventh graders at Immaculate Heart of Mary, too. Um, and I was teaching uh, catechism to sixth and seventh graders um, in the Hispanic ministry there. Uh, but I got all the kids who can't speak Spanish, even though their parents are, are Hispanic. Um, and that was really enriching to me because I really related to a lot of those kids. I mean, Immaculate Heart of Mary is a really poor parish. Um, and I, I saw myself and a lot of those little kids there that maybe didn't have much of a foundation or a background 
in the Catholic Church, really. Um, so then I was so blessed. Uh, Bishop Van said, you know, I want you to get some other experience, not just up there. Go to St. Killian. <laughs> and I got to come here in, I think, January of the year before last, right? And I lived here with Father Angelos and Father Tuan. I worked in the office, really worked hard, too. <laughs> um, and I got to know a lot of you. Um, and then I, I went to the seminary up at Mount Angel, and I didn't know what to expect. I was so nervous. And uh, one of my friends, Tyler, he's a seminarian. He came to watch me talk today. <laughs> uh, he, he, we, we would get ready to go to bed, and I would see him in the hallway, and I would say, dude, if you don't see me in the morning, it's because I left. <laughs> <laughs> so the first two weeks were really difficult to adjust to because I was kind of used to doing my own thing still. Um, I had not lived in community, really, uh, but I found that over the last year, I really was enriched by all of the most of the guys up there. Um, they challenged me a lot, and I think I challenged them maybe a little bit too. But here I am, and I just want to say thank you guys for always welcoming me and supporting me in many, many ways and just being there for me. So thank you. Thank you, Thomas. So, so far, you've heard from Father Ben, Thomas, who are, well, Father Ben already made promises of chaste celibacy. <laughs> Thomas, we pray that as he nears ordination to the diaconate, when he's ordained as a deacon, he'll make that promise as well. Let's now hear from one of our clergy who's actually married. So one of our deacons, either one who's brave. Okay. You see how this is going to work, don't you? <laughs> we have the priest, we have the seminarian, then we have the deacons. Oh, and then there's no time for Father Brandon. <laughs> I'm going to keep it really short, so there is time for Father Brandon. I'm Deacon Mark, and my wife Lori over here, we're kind of a team, so... Uh, my vocation, let's say the seeds were planted when I was in elementary school. I grew up in Westchester over by LAX, um, and I lived right next door to Loyola University, and I was raised for about five years by a priest at Loyola University called Father Christovich. And we were a whole bunch of kids, several generations of us, called the Christovites. And that's where the seeds were kind of planted. I went through Catholic school uh, until I got kicked out for smoking. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went into the military. I spent 26 years in the Air Force. And during that time in the Air Force, my spiritual life went and took many different roads. And I was here and there and I was everywhere. And it was just before I retired, uh, back in 1994, I was stationed in Virginia, and I had a trip out here to California to do some business for the Air Force. And I was on a drive going up I-5, and I was trying to find something on the radio to listen to, and there was just nothing. And I finally found one station, and it was a Christian broadcasting station. And I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to this music, not thinking and paying too much attention to it, but just driving. And then all of a sudden, it felt like I was completely washed, my body. I mean, just like, like water just ran right through me. And I, my life changed. I pulled over to the side of the road. I probably cried for about 15 minutes. And that was a life-changing experience for me. Yeah. You know, Got out of the military in 95. Uh, Lori and I got married in 99. And I went to teaching school. I taught at St. Uh, Dean de Lestinock in uh, Tustin. 
And while I was on uh, a, a trip, an, an evaluation trip, it's called a WASC evaluation at St. Norbert's, uh, I met an individual named Tony Booby, and he looks at me and he, during the evaluation. He says, have you ever thought about becoming a deacon? And I said, well, not really. I mean, you know, I, I was, we were going to church regular, and I was involved with the church really here at St. Killian ever since I retired, but I never really thought about becoming a deacon. So I gave it a little bit of thought, and Lori was a full-time student at Fullerton right now, you know, getting her teaching credential back. And uh, so that just wasn't a thing I could do, you know, because when you become a deacon, your wife has to do everything you do. <laughs> so that's why the Father Angelos calls her the deaconess. A few, a few years later, around 2001, 2002, 2003, somewhere along in there, Bob Kelleher, uh, we were after mass somewhere at the old church, and he comes up to me and says, have you ever thought about becoming a deacon? And I said, I think I'm getting called. <laughs> <laughs> so Lori was out of school and teaching at the time, and I was teaching at the time, and I looked into it, and 2011 I was ordained, and here I am. So actually, our wives actually have to sign a paper that says they are consenting that we become deacons. If they don't sign that paper, we don't get ordained. So uh, <laughs> all the power is right over here. In our lives, anyways. Uh, so I'm Deacon John. I'm a little younger than Deacon Mark. I was ordained in 2019. And I love this, this feeling of seeds because, um, well, we just had this in our gospel reading this past week. And I know everybody here heard that because you're all going to Catholic Mass because I see all these faces every single week. <laughs> but the seeds for me were also planted when I was very young. Um, I grew up in a very Catholic household. We went to Mass <clears throat> religiously every weekend. Um, my mother was a convert. She was Lutheran before she married my father. My dad is, I don't know how many generations back, Catholic. So we went to Mass every Sunday. And so it was just part of our lives. In fact, priests coming to our house was always a part of our lives. I remember sa Saturday mornings, my sister and I would be laying there, like all kids do, watching Saturday morning cartoons on the floor. And all of a sudden, the doorbell would ring. And my mom just instinctively knew, it's Father Buckman. And she'd run with her house. She'd actually be like in her you know, pajama type things, run, get a house coat on, run back the other way and start cooking breakfast. She goes, answer the door. So we'd go over and answer the door and there's Father Buckman smoking a cigarette. Can I come in for breakfast? <laughs> yeah, okay, come on in. So he'd come in for breakfast and then hang out and the priest always came to our house, drink bourbon with my father. It's where I learned at a very early age how to make old fashions <laughs> and mint juleps. So it was just part of our lives. And um, I, that carried on into college. I went to Chapman University, and, uh, uh, well, actually, let me go a little bit before that. I went to Servite High School, the best uh, Catholic high school in Orange County. <laughs> None of that out there. I got the mic right now, so. Um, and I remember every, once a year, the priest from our parish would say, hey, um, you know, we got to go to the seminary. You got to check it out. We're like, that means a whole day away from school. Sure, we're going to go. So we'd jump in the back of the parish uh, station wagon. This is all before seat belts. I think there were like 12 of us in the station wagon. Drive up to the seminary, go hang out for the day, have lunch, and we'd come back for pizza with the priest. And he goes, so what do you guys think? And we're like, this is great. Free food, day from school. I love this. We'll just talk to you next year. But the seeds were planted, right? So I uh, went away to college. I didn't really go away. I went to Chapman University right here. And uh, it was funny. I, was, I started as a pre-med major. Uh, kind of like Animal House, you know, pre-med, pre-law, whatever. It doesn't really make a difference because I actually am a lawyer now, but <laughs> that's a whole other story. So um, I, I w they sold Chapman as the Catholic College of Orange County because actually on a per capita basis, 60% of the enrollment when I went to Chapman was Catholic. Now it's, with, it's affiliated with the Disciples of Christ Church, but the huge Catholic population 
Um, they, they didn't have a Newman Center or anything like that, but we'd always go to Holy Family. And I, too, joined a fraternity. I still am actually very, very involved in my fraternity. And a lot of my fraternity brothers are actually Catholic. So it's just kind of this small world out there. Again, all these little seeds being planted. So I met my wife. Um, she was a transfer from Long Beach State, I think. And uh, our first, this is, I have to tell this story. So our, I, I got her number, and she's like, Don't, keep going. <laughs> I'm going. So we got plenty of time. We got to like eight or nine, right? That's what I was told. <laughs> Just kidding. So anyways, I, I, I got her number. I called her, set up a date. And at the time, I had really long hair <laughs> because I, I was waiting to get admitted to law school, and I didn't decide to cut it. And then I got admitted to law school, so I got a perm. <laughs> it's the 80s, OK? Come on. So I <laughs> went to her doorbell, and I rang the doorbell. And she opens the door. Hi. Closes the door on me. <laughs> but here we are 32 years later. <laughs> and she still signed the paper, let me become a deacon. I just <laughs> so um, I, I went away to law school, Santa Clara, and we had uh, a lot of Jesuit priests who, who taught law school. Uh, one of them, his name was Father Goda. He taught contracts. We called him the Black Death. <laughs> and um, then we relocated back down here, and we have three children. They're not really children anymore. They're all young adults in their 20s now. One will be 30 in, in September. And uh, Amy didn't have religion really before. Um, her, her family uh, didn't have a faith tradition. She became Catholic. So she graduated from um, college, became Catholic, then we got married, I think, well, all within like a month period, something like that, a week maybe, I, but it was really quick. And then we didn't go to Mass often, probably C's and E's like a lot of people, Catholic and Easter's, C's and E's. <laughs> and um, that was kind of us until we had kids, and then we were like, if we're going to raise our children in the church, we're going to go to church. So we kind of started going to church again, we got very, very involved at St. Norbert. So there's a lot of little, you know, things about St. Norbert with, with Mark hearing about it. Um, and uh, Father Pat Rudolph, who was here, he was actually my sponsor into the diaconate. So the Holy Spirit speaks to us in very unique, <laughs> interesting ways. Uh, if you remember Father Pat, he's, he's often ill, right? And he came into the sacristy. I was a sacristan setting up for Mass. And I like to go extra early because I just like to sit there and contemplate. And he comes in one day and he's like hacking, coughing, and goes, I can't, I can't do mass today. <coughs> you know, like, I can't preach. You're going to have to do something. I'm like, I can't do that. He goes, yeah, but you could. <laughs> and I was literally <laughs> thinking about asking him about the diaconate at that exact time. <laughs> so he goes, okay, uh, let's talk about it. So we, they, they form you. We talked a little bit. And um, the diaconate classes start every other year. So he put my name in, and I went to him, and I said, Father Pat, I'll do this deacon thing, being all proud, you know. <laughs> but I'll make one condition. I'm not moving parishes. And he goes, okay, yeah, that's fine. So I start taking the classes. Um, I think at, at the time, Amy was kind of like, oh, one more volunteer thing. And I go, it's not really a volunteer thing. It's a calling. And then we got into it, and she found out that it really is a calling. And then about halfway through formation, we get called into the, the head deacon office. We go in. We, we thought we were in trouble. <laughs> we're not going forward. And they go, hey, um, we're like probably worried. He goes, are you guys worried? Well, yeah, you called us into the office. You don't get called in the office unless there's something to worry about. Oh, no, you guys are doing fine, but we want you to move to St. Killian. And I, so remember, I, I said I was not moving. We both turned to each other and go, yeah, let's, we'll move to St. Killian. <laughs> so that was probably in like 2017-ish when we came here. And we sat in the pews with all of you. Uh, we went, finalized formation and became ordained in 2019. And then COVID hit. So um, our, it's a little untraditional path to the diaconate, but it's great. And we love being here. I left you like at least 10 minutes or no more. <laughs> but um, so that's, those are the seeds that are planted. And, and I, 
I, one thing I do want to tell you is I know there's a lot of young men, you don't have to be too, too young, I'm not that young, <laughs> who contemplate the diaconate and um, talk to us about it. Now, uh, we're permanent deacons. That means we won't become priests. There, there are ways that can happen, but we'll have to talk about that later. Um, you know, so, but it's a great calling. It's great ministry. And uh, it's, it's beautiful to have people like you in a parish that are so welcoming, loving, and caring. And this is a great place. So thank you very much. Thank you to our deacons for sharing tonight. So actually, Father Angelus is going to be dialing in in just a second. Give me one moment. Can you hear them? It's a joke. <laughs> but that leads us to the final talk of the night, mine. My story isn't anything that might be different from a lot of people. Uh, my story starts with sin, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in the garden, that's where the whole story begins, right? But then it comes further in, in the year of our Lord, 1992, at about eight something in the evening, my mom started having contractions as she was shopping. She was rushed to Kaiser Hospital, and there a happy little baby boy was born. <laughs> and ever since then, because I was born so late at night, well, I may not be ready to go places early in the morning, but I like to get up early in the morning. And so my mom would always say, because I had you so late at night, that's why you were always up early. And my thing was, I would wake up early because I was hungry. I'd wake up because I wanted food. And so at that time, I wasn't able to cook for myself. So I'd say, hey, wake up. <laughs> but my vocation story really does start from when I was born. Like a lot of us, all of us, our vocation starts from the very moment when we are formed, fashioned, and created. And then that story of our vocation unlocks as we begin to find what our passions are and where the will of the Lord is and where those two things intersect, that's where we find vocation. And so for a lot of you that are here, that vocation is married life. That you have joined yourself to your spouse as a way of saying we are going to get to heaven together. You have joined yourself in matrimony to your spouse to say, hey, we're on this mission together and we're going to get to heaven together. That's what the vocation of married life is. Vocation for priesthood is a little bit different. We espouse ourselves to the church and say, hey, we are going to get to heaven together. And so one of the ways in which that vocation truly began was in my family life. My grandparents were kind of like a second parent set of parents for me and my sister. My parents, I was the reconciliation baby. The reconciliation didn't happen. My parents are divorced. Um, my mom and my dad, they were better off as friends than they ever were as married people. Um, they were divorced. This isn't a sad story. I saw my dad more than most of the nuclear families ever see their parents. So I was very blessed in that. My parents divorced one another, but they didn't divorce the family. And so growing up, we lived with my grandmother and my grandfather. And so for them, when I didn't get something from mom, I knew who to go to because I was going to say yes. <laughs> and so... Growing up, I had this whole second set of family. Well, obviously, a whole second set of parents, almost. And I saw from my grandparents, my grandmother and my grandfather, I saw that the love that they shared for one another, of how they were willing to sacrifice and how they were willing to offer whatever it was for that other person. And so I saw from a very young age self-sacrificing love. And that was really exemplified on how my grandparents shared that love for one another. And it was a witness for me and my sister. I remember as we were growing up, we had thought about what did I want to do. I said that I wanted to be a sumo wrestler because one of my favorite movies <laughs> was, I think it was like The Five Ninjas. And I remember, it, it was a stupid kids movie, but I remember watching it and I remember that they were sumo wrestlers and they were always eating. <laughs> and I was like, I could do that. A professional eater, that the bigger you get, the stronger you are and the more competitive. Oh yeah, I could do that. And then I thought, maybe I wanted to be a lawyer. Maybe I wanted to do something else. Maybe I wanted to be a fireman, a police officer. And then my grandmother was sick. Uh, she had cancer. And so I thought, maybe I want to be a doctor to help people like her. And so growing up, I had these, all these ideas of what did I want to do in the future. 
I remember I was taking classes for First Communion and I hated going. I remember it was my friend Fonzie and myself, my mom would pick us up, well obviously my mom wasn't picking me up, we'd pick up my friend Fonzie, and we would go to religious education class. I remember the only good thing was is that we were in the same area and we could play together. And I remember at this point we weren't going to Sunday Mass, we weren't really church-going people, we had the faith, but it wasn't something that was an active part of our life. And so my mom, she said, well, we may not be going to Sunday, but we're going to go early for daily mass on Thursdays, saying that it would count for our Sunday. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. Don't do that. But we would go. And so me and my friend Fonzie, we would be sitting in the pew. We would have to sit on opposite sides of my mom because we would mess around too much. And so she would give us the look. <laughs> and then afterwards, my mom worked in the front office for catechism classes. And me and my friend Fonzie would go. I remember after we made our first communion, I made the decision that I wasn't going to go anymore because I didn't think it was of anything of value. I said, we don't go to church. Why, why continue coming here? It's kind of a waste of time, right? So I heard some ahs, but that's... <laughs> remember where we're at. <laughs> the story gets better. So at the time, I was thinking, it's kind of a waste of time. I was like in the third grade. I was saying, well... It could be cool. I want to do what Father Brennan does because he's happy. You know, he seems like a very joy-filled person. But at the same time, I didn't understand what that responsibility was. And we stopped going to, well, we never really went to church after that. I remember it was really when my sister had her confirmation experience. She was enlivened and she had the Holy Spirit. And so she was driving and she didn't like going anywhere by herself. So she drug me along with her. And so she said, I'm going to come to Mass. You're going to come with me. And I was like, do I have to? <laughs> and she would make it really good. She'd be like, we'll go out for fast food afterwards. Sold, I'm there. <laughs> we'll go out for dessert after. Sold, I'm there. <laughs> and so afterwards, it was no longer just going to mass together, but instead we started being ushers at that mass because we we're two young people that they didn't really know what to do with. And they were like, hey, come and help us. And so all of a sudden, me and my sister, we became the ushers at the six o'clock mass at St. Pius. My sister was working for the county in the afternoons, and she would work from like 6.30 in the morning, she would get off at four, and then she would rush back home, get showered, get changed, and we would be there for mass. And that was our routine for years. And then she started teaching faith formation classes. And because she didn't like doing anything alone, I had to start going with her to those faith formation classes. So I was her aide. And so for many years, we were sitting in the same class, and I would remember passing out papers. And then we would talk about our faith. And while that was all going on, I was learning about my faith all the more, too. And then I started going to the confirmation program. Again, it was something that I wasn't looking forward to do. It wasn't something that I wanted to do. But instead, it was something that I was open to doing. Because I was already volunteering, because I was doing all of these other service projects that were happening at the church, I figured, well, I'll give it a shot. I'll go, but I don't want to be in their class because my sister at this point was teaching confirmation and so I said, keep me away from them. Let me have my own experience. And so I remember I was going through our confirmation program and I loved it. At this point, I was already volunteering. I was already assisting. And so when I made my own confirmation, I remember the director of religious education said, you have your own class next year and then just walked away. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, shouldn't we talk about this before? The decision was already made. And so I remember I had myself and my best friend, Jonathan, and I said, well, I need somebody to help me. And so he got drug along for the ride, too. And so I remember I was, you know, writing up Mr. Lopez as a sophomore in high school, Mr. Lopez on the, on the right board, and all of a sudden I hear crying. And I was like, what is happening here? And then all of a sudden... It's like a cry cry. And so I turn around and I'm thinking, I don't want to turn around because if I turn around, it's real. A kid had gotten punched in the face the first night of me teaching the confirmation program, or not a confirmation program, our faith formation program for children that were making their first communion. And so I was thinking, I am a sophomore in high school. I do not know how to handle this. His mother was standing right next to him. I turned to her and I was like, how did you let your child get punched in the face? I was like, that's your problem, not mine. 
And so I'm calling frantically our director of religious education, and I'm saying, this is not for me. I don't know if I can do this. Turns out the kid was in the wrong program. He was in the wrong classroom. He should have been somewhere else. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is how we start? It can only go up from here, right? And it did. It was a great blessing because every time that I was talking, proclaiming, teaching our faith to third graders, it was an opportunity for me to grow, learn, and reflect. Because if you can't explain something to a third grader, that they will understand in a way that they will understand, how can we ever talk and enliven that own faith for ourselves? It doesn't have to be all of this deep theological verbiage, but instead, what does it actually mean at the heart of it? The theological verbiage is very important. It's how we understand the concepts, but if we cannot articulate and talk about how the faith has transformed us and has changed us, then it's kind of for loss. And so for my own practice, I was thinking, how can I talk about this to third graders? How can I talk to this, talk about this deep theological topic to first graders? In my own way, I was thinking, how can I dumb it down? But it wasn't a dumbing down, but instead it was a deeper reflection for myself to be able to fully articulate what it was that was happening. And so I remember I was sitting in my mom's closet. She was in our house, she was upstairs and she had a walk-in closet and her desk was right there. She was on the computer. And I remember I was just sitting on the floor in her closet and we were just talking and I said, mom, I kind of really like this and I think I might want to be a priest. And she said, absolutely not. We're not having this conversation. Think of something else. <laughs> and I swear she didn't like turn from her computer, nothing. She was ready for that response. And I said, well, I'm, I am kind of thinking about it. And she's like, well, think of something else. <laughs> because her greatest desire was always to be a grandmother. Her greatest desire is to be a grandmother. I know that one day soon she will be. Now I know that she has 1.2 billion grandchildren in the world that she needs to be praying for. So mom, pray for him. But now, you know, this opportunity, I remember it was like a no. That's not going to happen. That's just not going to be. And so I was praying and I was reflecting and I was like, obviously I'm going to be an adult soon. I can make my own decisions. And I remember when I was at college, I was studying at Cal State Fullerton. I was praying and reflecting about what I was going to do after. I was applying to medical school. I was going to be applying to a master's program. I was thinking, what am I going to do? I know what I want to do to be happy, but I'm also asking the Lord, what does he want me to do to be happy? At this point, I had already been an altar server, not an altar server, excuse me. I had been an usher. I had been a Eucharistic minister. I had been a volunteer in our parish for many, many years, for about eight years, teaching our faith formation programs for both young children, our high school students. So it's an opportunity for me to think, I'm drawing a lot of passion, and I love this. I think I'm called to serve the church in some way, somehow. And so I'd been praying and reflecting, and I had started doing the very dangerous thing of Googling vocation meetings and what it meant to be a priest and how did you do it. And I remember it was kind of like a gift and a calling because I remember seeing that there was a meeting that was going to be taking place on a Thursday at Christ Cathedral. And it was very soon, and so I made the decision that I was going to go. And me and my mom, we were driving back some from Riverside. We were visiting family. And I remember it was just me and her in the car. And I was driving, thanks be to God, because I wanted to make sure that I was in control of the car. <laughs> and so on our way home, you know, there was kind of a lull in the conversation like there always is. And I said, I think I'm going to be a priest, and I'm going to a discernment meeting. You can't stop me. <laughs> she doesn't say anything. She just starts crying. Because in her mind, she's thinking that her greatest desire is now done. And of course, my sister, we pray one day she's going to get married and have lots of children. <laughs> but she won't have any children from me. And so that was her hope, that she would have grandchildren from both of us. And so in her mind, her world is crashing and imploding in on herself. And I was like, Mom, it's not about you. <laughs> I t kind of told her, I was like, quit being selfish. I was like, but this is, this is a me thing, and I feel that I have to go. I was like, I'm not asking your permission. I'm not asking for your acceptance, but this is something that I'm going to do. It's like I was asking you to go do something terrible and horrible. I was like, Mom, I'm going to go to this vocation meeting to be a priest, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember I went, and for a whole year, I started the discernment process. I had been talking with our vocation director. I had been meeting with some of the other seminarians. I really talked about what it meant to be 
a priest? Like, what did it actually mean to be a priest? I saw what they did on the weekends. I saw kind of what they did throughout the week. I knew what they were in involved with. But I wanted to know, what was it like? Because I don't like going into something that with an unknown variable. So I was asking all the hard questions. I was asking, what does it mean? How do I do it? What are the steps? What does it look like? What if I fail? What do all of those things mean? And I remember after a, a year's time, I was praying and I was reflecting. I said, Lord, I know that I'd be a really good husband and a father. I know that. Because to be a really good priest, you would have to be a good husband and father. Because your desire for your children extends to all of you, extends to everyone that I encounter, because I have that fatherly, paternal love, that I desire the best for you. And that stems from wanting to be a good husband and a father. And so I remember I was praying and I was reflecting and I had my pros and cons list of what I was going to do, whether I was going to go to a master's program or medical school or if I was going to try to join the seminary. And after a lot of prayer and reflection, obviously, where I am now, I had emailed the vocation director at 5 in the morning because I was afraid that his inbox would get so flooded in that he wouldn't see it. <laughs> and so I got up early in the morning. I had sent him an email, and I had said, after this whole year's discernment, I said, I feel that I'm really being called to apply to the seminary. I totally understand it if you're not feeling that way on the opposite end. I said, but I felt that I needed a call, or I needed to send this email. Looking forward to hearing back from you. I figured his inbox would be so flooded at that time that he wouldn't get to it. It would be something he scrolled past. It wasn't a big deal. Five minutes later, praise God, I've been waiting for this day. Here's this. Here's this. Here's this. Here's this. Let's have a meeting next week. And so he sent me all the applications. He sent me everything that I needed to do. And I said, oh, my gosh. I felt that that was a Holy Spirit moment of saying, hey, in trust and in faith, you would put that out there, and I'm going to respond immediately to let you know that I am affirming that this is something that should happen. And so I remember I was very nervous about it. At first, I didn't tell my family that I was applying until after I had completed everything. I kind of had my packet ready, and I was ready to submit, and I kind of let them all know. I said, this is something that's happening. I want you to all to be happy for me, because in any, any regard, any vocation that I would have chosen, I knew that they were going to be happy for me. I remember when I was ordained as a deacon, the demeanor of my mom when I was in high school telling her that I was thinking about being a priest was the complete polar opposite from months and years before I was ever ordained as a deacon of how proud she was that she was disturbing people after they had received Holy Communion to pass out my bookmark and was saying, pray for my son, he's going to be a priest. <laughs> And now my mom is so proud that she will stop people, even just people out shopping that have no care or concern. She's like, my son's a priest. And I was like, mom, I was like, I know that I am. I was like, but stop introducing me to random people. <laughs> I was like, we're trying to get in and out of Costco in 20 minutes. Like, come on. <laughs> now my mom is so beyond proud and beyond overjoyed at the thought that her son is a priest that it's a beautiful, wonderful vocation that each of us are offered each of us are open to. I know that my own vocation has just begun. I'm starting my third year of priesthood. It's a great blessing. Last year I was at St. Well, last year I was here. The year before, my first year of priesthood, I was at St. Pius V in Buena Park. St. Pius V in Buena Park is the church where I was baptized, made my first communion, where I was confirmed, where I had volunteered, where I served as a Eucharistic minister, where I had served on our RCIA team, where I had welcomed my friend who had finished his Eucharist and confirmation. I walked with him as a sponsor through the RCAA program. St. Pius V was a place that I had a lot of my firsts. And as a priest, it is a place where I did have all of my firsts. It's a place where I heard my first confessions for a Saturday afternoon. It was a place where I was able to witness my first marriage. It was a place where I was able to baptize all the babies after I had been ordained as a deacon. It was a place where I was able to go and preach. And the people that were there in the congregation were the people that I knew because there was a deep history for 20 plus years. And so when I was looking at the people, when I was looking at the community, I knew them. And I knew that they were praying for me and I knew that they were supporting me. And it was such a beautiful and wonderful thing to be able to serve the people who had ministered and who had been praying for me and who had been caring for me all of those years before I was ordained. 
And it was a beautiful opportunity when I got the phone call that I was going to be here at St. Killian and be able to serve you all. It was nerve-wracking. <laughs> Partially because I only knew the experience of knowing my community. I came here and I really didn't know anybody. There were a few people that I knew just in passing or knew of them or had met them several times before. But beyond that, I didn't know anyone here. So my first response was, I don't know anybody. What am I gonna do? And then I remembered my best friend who I've known since kindergarten, lives six minutes up the street. And it's a great blessing that I can be with his wife and his three children and we can share and bring community with one another and so it's like, at first I knew that I had them. And now it's a beautiful opportunity that I know you all. That you've walked with me, you've joined, well, you've allowed me to join in this beautiful community and allowed me to help shape, usher, and form this community too. It's been a great blessing, but the story's not over. It's continuing. Our vocation doesn't end because we started something, but instead it's a continuation from there. I pray that I'm able to give 70 years of service to the church. I'm 31 years old right now. I pray if the Lord gives me that opportunity that I'll be able to serve him for 70 years. And if he takes me earlier than that, he takes me earlier than that. But our vocation doesn't end because we said yes to something. Instead, that's the moment that it begins. So a lot of you that have made that beautiful sacrament with your spouse, when you said, I do with one another, that's not when your vocation ended, right? No, that's when you began your vocation with one another. And so our vocation to the priesthood, our vocation to service of God's people doesn't begin because we said some, or it doesn't end because we said yes to something, but instead that is its inception, that's its beginning point. And so for all of us here that have very different vocations, the Lord calls us each individually as sons and daughters to follow him, to know him, to love him, and to serve him. And so for each of us who are on this path of vocation, whatever it might be, we have to remember who we are as beloved sons and daughters. He has called that very gift of salvation. He calls us to know him. And that could be by reflecting on the scriptures. Coming to know him in that personal relationship that we have with him. An encounter to serve him. And by serving him, it can be in serving our brothers and sisters. And from that gift of service, to experience his salvation forever for eternity. All of our vocations is to get to heaven. In your earthly lives, as many of you have taken on that commitment of married life, your commitment is to your spouse. If they're here with you right now, look at them and say, we're getting to heaven together. And the commitment that Father Angelos, Father Ben, and myself make to you is that just as we laid down our life and as we were laying on the marble of the cathedral, we had given our commitment, our yes to the Lord. We made a commitment to the whole universal church that we're going to get to heaven together starts with prayer, ends with prayer, but it leads us closer to him. And so I pray for Thomas and our other seminarian, Tyler, and for all the seminarians that are currently undergoing formation, that their hearts will be so open to accept that call from the Lord, to say yes to him and to follow him. But for each of us too, that as we have said yes to the Lord, to remember that he's calling us to that life eternal. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so we will end our night with a prayer. So Father Ben, I invite you up to conclude us off with a prayer. God bless you all. Okay. I know it's late, but okay, let us uh, conclude with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your gift, the gift that you give to each one of us, the vocation to go to heaven together. We ask you to continue to pour your Holy Spirit among us so that we can follow you, live the life that you want us to be, so that everyone can see us, can see you in us. We add this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Good night, everyone.